Hello students. Once again, I am updating a previously recorded intro to a module to tell you about a couple of new additions to uh, the uh, uh, visual communication in the news. There was a story on the March 25th New York Times uh, about a museum display called Jews, Money, and Myth. And this relates to um, the propaganda content that uh, you covered last week. Uh, so there is a uh, museum in Britain which sort of recounts the way that images of Jews uh, were used uh, in the mass media, in publications, posters, newspapers, etc., uh, to promote uh, sort of anti Semitic prejudice. And then um, I think it was on Sunday, in the Sunday um, issue of the New York Times, there's a story about the fact that in China now, censors are uh, sort of blurring out uh, earrings that are worn by male pop stars or they're covering the fact that popular male pop stars have dyed their hair pink. And so this is uh, relating to the fact that the censors uh, working for the Chinese uh, communist government realize that these kind of expressions of individualism are not consistent with uh, sort of other overarching principles where they want uh, everybody in China to be a good citizen and, and well-behaved, etc. So the fact that they have not suppressed the pop stars themselves, but the ways the pop stars present themselves and allow themselves to be seen and photographed, then what they will do is they will blur out the earring or they will uh, doctor the footage so that the, uh, the person with the pink hair is wearing a hat. So those are a couple of uh, interesting uh, pieces of visual communication in the news that relate to uh, what we did last week. We're moving now into the moving image. So uh, now this intro will connect to uh, sort of an, a... Uh, a rundown of the different content that you'll be asked to read and view this week. And I'm now introducing uh, the visual design project number three, which is involves uh, images that move. So uh, you do not have to shoot video. You do not have to make uh, a movie uh, as good as either of the two videos that are uh, in here as samples of work in the past. Um, you can use a PowerPoint. Uh, I've got a couple other ones that I'm going to throw in there as well. But um, you can see that uh, some people have done some, some quite interesting and remarkable things where they've used either just a, a cell phone video or a better video camera uh, and communicated some sort of story uh, with motion. So uh, I'm going to attach this now to the rest of it and be back in touch with you soon. Ago, I pointed out that the, the word theory comes from the Greek theorine which is uh, to, to look at or to view. So that basically a theory is a way of looking at something. So you, uh, most of you used uh, Lester's six perspectives. Some people combine that then with some uh, uh, theory of typography, particularly stuff coming from the, the Goodhart Wilcox text. And so um, one of the things I noted is that there's an old saying, every picture tells a story. And so each one of these pictures that you chose, there was a story behind it. And one of the things that the theory allowed you to do was tell a uh, kind of interesting and coherent story. And again, the more coherent the essay in terms of you proceeded in an orderly fashion from one aspect to another, and also the more um, sort of careful the editing of the prose at the surface level, at the sentence level, and the paragraph level, uh, make for better stories or stories that are a little harder to follow. But uh, what that then connects to is uh, the readings that we had for uh, last week, and one of them was um, visual manipulation in mass media. So we actually had three different examples of propaganda. We had the uh, U.S. propaganda produced in World War II to support the war effort, and so that was stuff that uh, some of you are probably already familiar with, and you know, if you uh, looked at it, you'd say, okay, this is, this is kind of good stuff. It's just doing something we want to be doing. Uh, and then there was the propaganda film uh, uh, by the Third Reich. And if you spend any time looking at uh, the parts of that that I had identified, you could say it's like, wow, I can see how this is, this is very powerful. And it really has to do with 
these visual images. You have images of German culture, and you have images of uh, you know military strength and religious uh, uh, sort of devotion and um, you know health and fitness and hygiene and all these ideas that uh, the filmmaker um, uh, Lenny Riefenstahl was able to communicate in a story um, that is largely just a collection of images. Um, we are soon going to be moving into visual communication that moves. Um, so that was sort of a nice way to get into it. And then finally, there was that collection of uh, political cartoons that were uh, anti-communist cartoons in different countries, former Soviet satellite countries, just as the uh, Soviet Union was falling apart. So those three different approaches to propaganda, I hope, gave you um, sort of a sense of there were some commonalities there in terms of what it is that someone who has a message that they want to communicate, the pictures that they pick, and the reliance upon certain symbols that the, the audience for those pictures would understand um, the, the symbol of a family sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner as uh, symbolic of freedom from want, etc. So I hope um, you were able to gain some understanding of the way propaganda worked in those three different connections. The other reading, Perception and Memory, I'm not going to talk about much because you have a quiz on it. It's not due until Wednesday of this week. But the whole idea, if we go back to the first week, one of the things uh, that was in the reading, uh, and it was on one of the first quizzes, was, okay, the behaviorist notion of vision, that a stimulus comes into our eye and then we respond to it, clearly is not adequate to the complexity of what's going on. And so then one of the things that is going on is we are constructing stories. And then one of the most interesting things of recent research is that we are constructing stories almost instantaneously. You know, within a nanosecond of perceiving it, we are remembering it, but we're not remembering it correctly. We are misremembering it within a nanosecond of perceiving it. So it's not just the case that every picture tells a story, but we are in the business of making stories based upon who we are. So what we bring to something we see is uh, rather significant. So depending upon your ethnicity, your race, your religious beliefs, your background, the family that you grew up in, you're going to bring those things to anything you see. And then you're going to write the story of what you saw and so then the whole notion of, you know, objective observation that somehow you would have an un unbiased interpretation of what you saw uh, gets a little bit uh, problematic. Okay, so um, visual design number th project number three. It's in this module. You'll be able to click on it and see what it is. And so this time now you are going to do something that involves motion media, motion graphics. So in the assignment, you can see that you can do this with a, a PowerPoint, with a narrated PowerPoint. You can do it. I used a thing called, I um, can't remember what it's called, but you'll see the example that I've made in there. Um, or you can shoot video. So I suggested in the assignment, in past years, uh, people uh, doubled up and formed teams. And that was handy if they're shooting video because then you got one person operating the camera and the other person maybe being the on-camera talent. Because this is an online class, and I don't know to what degree any of you actually know each other or are in classes with each other, that might be kind of challenging. But if I can do anything to support you, uh, you know, uh, pairing up with somebody else, let me know. Uh, short of that, uh, you might have a family member who could operate the camera if you're choosing to use video. But again, you don't have to use video. Uh, but there are, uh, well, not in the samples that I have attached to the assignment, but I'll show you some samples of what, oh no, there is one, the... Uh, um, uh, what's his name? The uh, the Swiss tennis star, uh, Roger Federer, slow motion of his serve. So both slow motion or speeded up motion are ways that you can use moving images to communicate something. Okay, so um, that assignment is not due for uh, it's almost three weeks. Uh, uh, I think April sixteenth. So then um, we've got three other parts of this module, vi visual communication and interactive media. So I assigned a kind of short theoretical article, but it's very dense. And very quickly into the article, the author referred to another theoretical article, which is fairly dense. 
And so in years past, I realized this stuff is, is kind of challenging. So what I did was I created a PowerPoint that explains some of the ideas in these two readings. And then um, a year or two ago, I actually videotaped myself delivering that PowerPoint. So you have access to PDFs of the articles. You have a PowerPoint explaining the articles. And one of the things I often do in PowerPoint is I lot of put a lot of stuff in the notes pages. Well, in this case, there's not much in the notes pages. So the stuff that's not in the notes pages, you can actually see me by watching the video. Now, the video was the first portion of a three-hour class, so the video runs 59 minutes. One of the great things about videos on YouTube is you can watch them at a faster speed. So depending upon how fast you can tolerate me talking, you could actually watch that video in as few as 30 minutes. So the two articles are Visual Communication in Interactive Media and the Three Paradigms of HCI, that's Human-Computer Interaction. And then after that, I go to Steve Krug, a web design uh, expert, author of Don't Make Me Think. And then he's talking about skeuomorphs. You'll figure out what they are from a Canvas page and flat design. And Steve is a rather entertaining presenter. So in the video of me giving a lecture, in that lecture, I'm showing the relevant Steve Krug video, so I think you'll enjoy that. And then it ends up with um, uh, a page and a chapter from uh, Luke Wibleski on web design. Luke Wibleski is now a uh, sort of a product designer at Google, uh, and he's worked his way up to that through being sort of a big wig, a, a um, web design savant for some of the uh, premier tech uh, companies uh, in the recent past. So that's all that's in this week's agenda. I'm going to save this now, post it, and put it as the intro to the Week 9 agenda and also intro on the front page. Um, within a short period, I am going to update my visual affordances of social media and talk a little bit more about the problem of uh, Facebook and uh, violations of uh, people's privacy. And then um, I will actually uh, give you a link to, I have a, page, a Wix page, that I've used for several years, and it's a mess of a page because I only use it as a landing spot so that I can go find the links that I most frequently use. But I actually cleaned it up a little bit, and so I'll direct you to that. And so you can see one of the things that is true now is that you can make uh, rather remarkable web pages using something like Wix because of the functionality they have built into it, and it can be totally free. Um, if you want to pay, then you can have it where it's not basically advertising Wix to everybody who comes to your page. But I think you'll see uh, some of the things that I was able to do in Wix to make my page interactive, even though years ago, let's see how many years ago, probably 2005, like 13 years ago, um, I was pretty good at using Dreamweaver to make uh, websites, but not interactive websites. They're kind of like Web 1.0 rather than Web 2.0. Well, with Wix, you can go Web 2.0, probably you know Web 3.0, depending upon what that might mean to you. Um, so I will give you a link to that. So that's the end of the intro for today, and uh, I look forward to being in touch with you again soon.